Chapter 7, Section 1. Are competing governments anarchism? <laughs> no, of course not. Yet, according to so-called anarcho-capitalism, it is. This can be seen from the ideas of Gustav de Molinari. Hart is on firmer ground when he argues that the 19th century French economist Molinari is a true founder of so-called anarcho-capitalism. With Molinari, he argues, the two different currents of anarchist thought converge. He combined the political anarchism of Burke and Godwin with the nascent economic anarchism of Adam Smith <laughs> and Say to create new forms of anarchism. That has been called anarcho-capitalism or free market capitalism. Of course, Godwin, like other anarchists, did not limit his anarchism to purely political issues, and so he discussed economic anarchism as well in his critique of private property, as Proudhon also did later. As such, to artificially split anarchism into political and economic spheres is both historically and logically flawed. While some dictionaries limit anarchism to opposition to the state, anarchists did and do not. The key problem for Hart is that Molinari refused to call himself an anarchist. He did not even oppose government. As Hart himself notes, Molinari proposed a system of insurance companies to provide defensive property and called these insurance companies governments, even though they did not have a monopoly within a given geographical area. And as Hart notes, Molinari was the sole defender of such free market justice at the time in France. Uh, Molinari was clear that he wanted a regime of free government counterpoising monopolistic or communist governments to free governments. This would lead to freedom of government rather than its abolition, not freedom from government. For Molinari, the future would not bring the suppression of the state, which is the dream of the anarchists. It will bring the diffusion of the state within society, that is, a free state in a free society. As such, Molinari can hardly be considered an anarchist, even if anarchist is limited to purely being against government. Moreover, in another sense, Molinari was in favor of the state. As we discussed in, section, uh, in chapter 6, these companies would have a monopoly within a given geographical area. They have to in order to enforce the property owner's power over those who use but do not own the property in question. The key contradiction can be seen in Molinari's advocating of company towns, privately owned communities. His term was proprietary company. Instead of taxes, people would pay rent, and the administration of the community will either be left in the hands of the company itself or handled special organizations set up for this purpose. Within such a regime, those with the most property had proportionally the greater say in matters which affected the community. If the poor objected, then they could leave. Given this, the idea that Molinari was an anarchist in any form can be outright dismissed. His system was based on privatizing government, not abolishing it, as he himself admitted. This would be different from our current system, of course, as landlords and capitalists would be hiring, uh, hiring force directly to enforce their decisions rather than relying on a state which they control indirectly. His system, as we proved in Chapter 6, would not be anarchist as can be seen, and can be seen from American history. There, capitalists and landlords created their own private police forces and armies, which regularly attacked and murdered union organizers and strikers. As an example, here is Henry Ford's service department private police force. Quote, In 1932, a hunger march of the unemployed was planned to march up to the gates of the Ford plant in Dearborn. The machine guns of the Dearborn police and the Ford Motor Company service department killed four and wounded a score of others. Ford was fundamentally and entirely opposed to trade unions. The idea of working men questioning his prerogatives as an owner was outrageous. The River Rouge plant was dominated by the autocratic regime of Bennett's servicemen. Bennett organized and trained the 3,500 private policemen employed by Ford. His task was to maintain discipline amongst the workforce, protect Ford's property and power, and prevent unionization. Frank Murphy, the mayor of Detroit, claimed that, quote, Henry Ford employs some of the worst gangsters in our city. The claim was well-based. Ford's service department policed the gates of his plants, infiltrated emergent groups of union activists, posed his workers to spy on men on the line. Under this tyranny, the Ford, uh, the Ford worker had no security, no rights. So much so that any information about the state of things within the plant could only be freely obtained from ex-Ford workers. Hugh B um, Bain on working for Ford, pages 29 to 30. The private police attacked women workers handing out pro-union handbills and gave them, quote, a severe beating. 
At Kansas and Dallas, similar beatings were handed out to the Union men. This use of private police to control the workforce was not unique. General Motors spent $1 million on espionage and employing 14 detective agencies and 200 spies at one time between 1933 and 1936. The Pinkerton detective, uh, detective agency found anti-unionism its most lucrative activity. We must also note that the Pinkertons had been selling their private police services for decades before the 1930s. For over 60 years, the Pinkerton Detective Agency had been, quote, specializing in providing spies, agent provocateurs, and private armed forces for employers combating labor organizations. By 1892, it had provided services for management in 70 major labor disputes, and its 2,000 active agents and 30,000 reserves totaled more than the standing army of the nation. Jeremy Breacher, strike, page 55. With this force available, little wonder unions found it so hard to survive in the U.S. Only a so-called anarcho-capitalist would deny that this is a private government, employing private police to enforce private power. Given that unions could be considered as defense agencies for workers, this suggests a picture of how so-called anarcho-capitalism may work in practice, radically different from the pictures painted by its advocates. The reason is simple. It does not ignore inequality and subjects economics to an anarchist analysis. Little wonder, then, that Proudhon stressed that it, quote, becomes necessary for the workers to form themselves into democratic societies with equal conditions for all members on pain of a relapse into feudalism. Anarchism, in other words, would see capitalistic and proprietary exploitation stopped everywhere, the wage system abolished. And so the economic organization would replace the governmental and military system, the general idea of the revolution, pages 227 and 281. <coughs> Clearly, the idea that Proudhon shared, with the sa- uh, shared the same political goal as Molinari is a joke. He would have dismissed such a system as a little more than an updated form of feudalism in which the property owner is sovereign and the worker's subjects. Unsurprisingly, Molinari, unlike the individualist anarchists, attacked the jury system, argued that it obliged people to perform the duties of judges. This is pure communism. People would judge according to the color of their opinions rather than according to justice. As the jury system uh, used amateurs, i.e. ordinary people, rather than full-time professionals, it could not be relied upon to defend the power and property rights of the rich. As was noted in Chapter 1, Section 4, Rothbard criticized the individualist anarchists for supporting juries for essentially the same reasons. But as is clear from Hart's accounts, Molinari had little concern that working-class people should have a say in their own lives beyond consuming goods. His perspective can be seen from his lament about those (coughs) colonies where slavery had been abolished without the compulsory compulsory labor being replaced with an equivalent quantity of free labor, i.e. wage labor. There has occurred the opposite of what happens every day before our lives. Simple workers have been seen to exploit in their turn the industrial entrepreneurs, demanding from them wages which bear absolutely no relation to the legitimate share in the product which they ought to receive. The planters were unable to obtain for their sugar a sufficient price to cover the increase in wages and were obliged to furnish the extra amount at first out of their profits and then out of their very capital. A considerable number of planters have been ruined as a result. It is doubtless better that these accumulations of capital should be destroyed than the generations of men should perish. But would it not be better if both survived? So, workers exploiting capital is the opposite of what happens every day before our eyes. In other words, it's normal that entrepreneurs exploit workers under capitalism. Similarly, this is uh, what is legitimate share which workers ought to receive? Surely that is determined by the eternal laws of supply and demand and not what the capitalists, or Molinari in this instance, think is right, right? And those poor former slave drivers, they really do deserve our sympathy after all. What horrors they face from the imposition subjected upon them by their ex-chattels that they had to reduce their profits. 
How dare their ex-slaves refuse to obey them in return for what their ex-owners think was their legitimate share in the produce? How simple these workers are, not understanding the sacrifices their former masters suffer, nor appreciating how much more difficult it is for their ex-masters to create the product without the whip and the branding iron to aid them. As Marx so rightly comments, and what, if you please, is this legitimate share, which, according to Molinari's own admission, the capitalists in Europe daily neglects to pay? Over yonder in the colonies, where the workers are so simple as to exploit the capitalists, Molinari feels a powerful itch to use police methods to set on the right road the law of supply and demand, which works automatically everywhere else. An added difficulty in arguing that Molinari was an anarchist is that he was a contemporary of Proudhon, the first self-declared anarchist, and lived in a country with a vigorous anarchist movement. Surely, if he was really an anarchist, he would have proclaimed his kinship with Proudhon and joined in the wider movement. He did not, as Hart notes, as regards Proudhon. Their differences in economic theory were considerable, and it's probably for this reason that Molinari refused to call himself an anarchist in spite of their many similarities in political theory. Molinari refused to accept the socialist economic, economic ideas of Proudhon, and in Molinari's mind, the term anarchist was intimately linked with the socialist and statist economic views. Yet Proudhon's economic views, like Godwin's, flowed from his anarchist analysis and principles. They cannot be arbitrarily separated, as Hart suggests. So while arguing that Molinari was just as much as an anarchist as Proudhon, Hart forgets the key issue. Proudhon was aware that private property ensured that the proletarian did not exercise self-government during working hours, i.e. was not a self-governing individual. As for Hart claiming that Proudhon had statist economic views, it simply shows how far a so-called anarcho-capitalist perspective is from genuine anarchism. Proudhon's economic analysis, his critique of private property and capitalism flowed from his anarchism and was an integral aspect of it. To restrict anarchism purely to opposition to the state, Hart is impoverishing anarchist theory and denying its history. Given that anarchism was born from a critique of private property as well as the state, this shows the false nature of Hart's claim that, quote, Molinari was the first to develop a theory of free market pro, uh, proprietary anarchism that extended the laws of the market and a rig uh, rigorous defense of property to its logical extreme. Hart shows how far from anarchism Molinari was as Proudhon had turned his anarchist analysis to property, showing that defense of property led to the opposition of the many and led to the oppression of the many by the few in social relationships identical to those which mark the state. Moreover, Proudhon argued that the state would always be required to defend such social relations. Privatizing it would hardly be a step forward. Unsurprisingly, Proudhon dismissed the idea that the laissez-faire capitalists shared his goals. Quote, the school of say, Proudhon argued, was the chief focus of counter-revolution next to the Jesuits and has for 10 years past seemed to exist only to protect and applaud the execrable work of the monopolists of money and necessities, deepening more and more the obscurity of a science naturally difficult and full of complications. Much can be, can, uh, the same can be said of so-called anarcho-capitalists, incidentally. For Proudhon, quote, the principles of Malthus and of Say, who oppose with all their might any intervention of the state in matters commercial or industrial, do not fail to avail themselves of this seemingly liberal attitude and to show themselves more revolutionary than the revolution. More than one honest searcher has been deceived thereby. However, this apparent anti-statist attitude of supporters of capitalism is false, as pure free market capitalism cannot solve the social question which arises because of capitalism itself. As such, it was impossible to abolish the state under capitalism. Thus, quote, this inaction of power in economic matters was the foundation of government. What need should we, uh, should we have of a political organization if power once permitted us to enjoy economic order? Instead of capitalism, Proudhon advocated the constitution of value, the organization of credit, the elimination of interest, the establishment of working men's associations, and the use of a just price.
the idea of revolution, page 225, 226, and 233. Clearly, then, the claims of Molinari was as an anarchist fail, as he, unlike his followers, were aware of what anarchism actually stood for. Hart, in his own way, actually acknowledges this. Quote, in spite of his protestations to the contrary, Molinari should be considered an anarchist thinker. His attack on the state's monopoly of defense must surely warrant the description of anarchism. His reluctance to accept this label stemmed from the fact that the socialists had used it first to describe a form of non-statist society, which Molinari definitely opposed. Like many original thinkers, eh, Molinari had to use the concepts developed by others to describe his theories. In his case, he had come to the same political conclusions as the communist anarchists, eh, although he had been working within the liberal tradition. And it's therefore not surprising that the terms used by the two schools were not compatible. It would not be until the latter half of the 20th century that radical free, li free trade liberals would use the word anarchist to describe their beliefs. It should be noted that Proudhon was not a communist anarchist, but the point remains. The aims of anarchism were recognized by Molinari as being inconsistent with his ideology. Consequently, he rightly refused the, rape of the label. If only his self-proclaimed followers in the latter half of the 20th century did the same, anarchists would not have to bother with them, maybe even today. As such, it seems ironic that the founder of so-called anarcho-capitalism should have come to the same uh, should uh, have come to the same conclusion as modern-day anarchists on the subject of whether his ideas are a form of anarchism 